Hi, I'm Matt Belcher, uh, the London 2012 Olympic gold medalist uh, and the Rio silver medalist. Um, you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the is... Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show, the show that takes you behind the scenes of how the world's top and most inspiring physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs and the lows of the journey in getting there. I trust you've had a great week, listeners. Thanks to everyone that's been dropping comments on social media, letting me know that you're enjoying the show and the guests that we've had on. That feedback means so much in bringing this show to you, so a massive thank you. Big thank you also, as always, to the Faithful Show listeners who have been dropping reviews over on iTunes. A massive thank you. That helps this show be positioned well in iTunes, which helps more people just like ourselves who are seeking to perform at their physical best discover the program and all the great insights that our generous guests share. Thanks to the following listeners who recently left reviews. Massive thank you to... Tiger J, who left a five-star review titled The Weekly Dose of Inspiration. Tyler wrote, I look forward to every Friday for the latest installment of the Physical Performance Show. It's great to get a genuine insight into the lives and minds of some of the world's best athletes. I find their stories inspiring for my own athletic journey. Keep up the great work, Brad. Tiger J, massive thank you, mate. Ruth15 left a review. Brilliant and very good company. An avid runner and strength and conditioning coach for runners, I stumbled across these products through a PT running client of mine who told me about the Lacars interview. Have consequently listened to every single interview with all of the runners. Love the fact that you ask similar questions and seeing the varied responses. These interviews have kept me company throughout a month of cross training on the bike and have made it a whole lot easier. Thanks very much, Brad, and please keep them coming. Would love to hear some interviews with coaches as well. Ruth15, massive thank you for that review and an insight. We do have some coaches scheduled for 2017. So, Ruth, keep listening in, and I agree. It's going to be great to hear the insights about performance and the the fun stories from some of the world's leading coaches. So, stay tuned, Ruth15. Guys, today's show is lovingly brought to you by Pogo Physio, where the physios that help you perform at your physical best through our industry-first, fixed-price, and unlimited-access finish line programs. That's right, unlimited access. Across our two-, six-, and 12-week programs, we enjoy seeing our clients achieve incredible results, no longer hamstrung by the cost of session-to-session treatment, but rather liberated through a, a new model whereby All we care about is your finish line being achieved. We do not care how many times you're in or out. We just want you to get to your finish line and remove the barrier of receiving session-to-session care when there can at times be a better way. Diagnosis depending. Listeners, on today's program, I had the distinct pleasure and privilege of catching up with Australian Olympic sailing star and 2012 London Olympic gold medalist in the 470 class, Mr. Matthew Belcher. Matt is a man of incredible accolade when it comes to the elite world of sailing. In today's episode, we dive deep into Matt's career from the early days through to meeting his wife, Rike, who's also an Olympic sailor, through to the birth of their two beautiful children, and how Matt, over many years and multiple Olympic campaigns, has been able to walk away with that coveted gold medal in the London Olympic campaign and the silver medal pairing up with Will Ryan in last year's 2016 Rio Olympic Games. Matt's 
accomplishments are so long. Matt's a six times consecutive world champion in the 470 class. 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Multiple times world sailor of the year. And beyond that, he's just a great bloke. So I think you're going to really enjoy this insight into what it takes to hit gold medal winning performances from an Olympic gold medalist himself, Mr. Matthew Belcher. Let's jump straight in. Listeners, I've been looking forward to sitting down with Matt for quite a while now. Uh, Matt's had a, a very busy schedule and we'll hear about that today. Uh, this guy, listeners, is, is is one of my favourite athletes. And not only is he, as per the bio, a gold medalist at the Olympic Games in 2012 in the sailing 470 class, also this year in Rio 2016, picked up the silver medal in the same event. But Matt's uh, been a multiple world champion. And I actually think your story, Matt, is one of the most undersung success stories of Australian modern Australian sport. And so, Matt, to have the chance to sit with you today and unpack the, the, the mechanics of the success, I've just been so looking forward to it. So, mate, welcome along. Yeah, no, what, a, what an introduction. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for having me. You know, um, being, being local just down the road, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of travel for me, but nice to be home and nice to actually sit down and have a bit of a chat finally. Oh, that's great. Matt, I'm going to throw you one straight out of the gates. What's one thing that scares Matt Belcher? <laughs> Uh, some of the expectation, actually. You know, the one thing that's, you know, in any professional uh, athlete, you know, the expectation of performance. You know, we, we put a lot on the line, you know, looking at the Olympic Games. It's four four years training just for one week. And, and I guess that, that scares you for failure, you know, for success, um, whether you succeed or you don't. And um, that's always, you know, running across your mind. And, and that also is a great motivator to um, to put those extra hours in, the extra weeks training, the extra months just to, to prepare everything that you can. And do you think that fear of failure, which is, I don't think I've ever had anyone that we've interviewed on the program, Matt, who hasn't cited something along those lines mm-hmm. as their chief fear, but do you think you can have the success without that fear? Yeah, in, in some part, yes, you know, um, but I think you've, you've got to know what's at stake. You know, you've got to realise that um, everything that you're doing, you don't have that opportunity to fail you know, or, or that opportunity to, to not get the result or not get, um, you know, your, your goal. And, and I think there's, there's particularly for, you know, for myself and, and, and most athletes, you've, you've got to know what's at stake. You know, for, for me, I'm, I'm getting older in my career. I've, I've had a, you know, fantastic career. I've got a family, I've got kids. Um, you know, my performance is, is, you know, is, is determined on, on the success. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, trying to put it all together and, and um, yeah, and, and perform the best that I can. And Matt, uh, let's, let's start with the most recent success, the 2016 Rio Olympic Games, and there's a whole build-up to Rio. I mean, we'll talk about London, we'll talk about carrying the flag, the, the Olympic flag in Sydney at the yep. closing ceremony, and that 12 years to get on your first Olympic team, we'll cover that. But if we reverse engineer in some ways, uh, Rio this year went in as the defending Olympic champion uh, in the 470 class. Uh, London, your success was with uh, Malcolm uh, Page, uh, Page yeah, sorry, yeah. Page, and then this year you were uh, paired up with Will Ryan. Um, how did you deal with that expectation as being the defending champion? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. You know, it's um, it's a great opportunity. You know, for me, the London uh, campaign was was a long journey. It took twelve years just you know just to represent Australia and, and to get that that spot and, and to go in uh, with the expectation with the pressure. Uh, we were three times world champion coming into it yep. um, with Malcolm's experience and you know to get the result straight away. You know, it was pretty pretty cool. Uh, so that that was exciting. But yes. Uh, definitely a lot more leadership, new partnership. Um, you know, the the roles had had reversed a little bit. You know, I was the older guy with the experience, the three times world champion, the Olympic champion, and and coming into that partnership with Will, it was you know basically a complete reversal for for myself as I went into London. Um, but you know, we we had a great a great time. You know, we had a great performance. We we basically achieved the same thing coming into Rio. You know, we won three of the four world championships. We'd won you know a lot of the events, and we we had a great great. Synergy. Uh, great uh, partnership and um, come away with a silver medal pretty pretty happy you know we were um, we definitely were, were vying for 
for, for the top of the podium. But just that one week, um, we, we got beaten. You know, got beaten by the current world champion that year. And, um, and yeah, it uh, certainly is a good motivator maybe to do another campaign. Yeah. But, you know, we, we had a lot of challenges, I guess, through through those those games that we, we weren't expecting. Actually, through the actual Olympic campaign itself, Matt? Yeah, you know, um, we, we had a great, a great campaign. Um, I made a lot of choices throughout that campaign to try and balance family, yep. uh, my sporting commitments as well, and uh, you know we, we had two children yep. during that uh, between London, between London and, and, Rio. and Rio, two beautiful uh, children, and that's something that's you know I guess not people you know people wouldn't expect as an athlete you know to, to go and, and start a family and to have that balance, and uh, I also would, was doing my masters as well. Uh, so doing a lot of lot of other things and and really tried to to balance my time and and to balance you know myself and I think for me that really helps my performance and and to get the most out of it and and you know to come back to the the first question is the expectation yeah. I know what's at stake and and I know that every every minute that I'm away every minute I'm on the water that I need to to perform at my best and that you know that's what helps sustain the results. Yeah, so I mean certainly throwing in the extra dynamics to your world with studies. <laughs> Two beautiful kids, um, and we're similar, you know, age, and I'm on the same journey. Two children and the dynamic and learning to, and, and yet as you say, it's and I found even in my work, it's about maximising the most of every minute because there's those other competing responsibilities that you know you want to be your best across all spheres, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's nice to hear you say, Matt. I think it's so refreshing that those extra responsibilities didn't take from you. If anything, they what added to your resolve and your commitment when you were at the sailing work to give it your, your best, right? Yeah, you know, my, my family is a huge, a huge support of, of the campaign and my wife used to compete for the Olympics as well. Yep. She represented Germany and, and you know, the time that we're away, it's, it's, it's a lot. You know, she, she had so much support and, and psychologically a lot of support for me and they're, they're really engrossed in, in our campaign and to, to have that support is, is only going to help, you know, uh, help for performance and, and help, you know, when I'm away and, and to, give, to get the best out of, out of myself. And, and Matt, to give listeners a bit of an idea of the sacrifices made, say at a family level, like when you refer to being away, my insight is that you can be away for months on end uh, with you know the preparations for major competitions such as the Olympic Games. What what do you mean by that when you're away? Like what does a year look like, say leading into Rio for, for you? Yeah, you know the the sailing program is it means that you know, we have to spend a lot of time pre competition to to get an understanding of the conditions, the currents, um, just you know the general environment you know so we know that when we're there we 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 feel like you know we're at home and for us Rio uh, meant you know five months of collective time up within a four-year period and that, that's a lot of a lot of time in the Olympic venue uh, in a different environment away from family we we spent 10 we did 10 trips to, to Rio uh, so we but what that meant was that we we got to the games. You know, we felt comfortable. We knew the places to, to walk or not to walk. We we knew where the local shopping you know shopping center was and to get our groceries. And you know, we felt very very comfortable. And I guess that's you know, I guess the the part of the success for the team in in general. Yeah. We we had our boat stored there more than three years out. We stayed in the same accommodation for more than two years prior to the games. We we you know sorted our room out and we did the same for for London. But what that means is it's a, it's a lot of time. You know, it's a lot of time away from family. And 10 trips, Matt, to be clear, is that 10 trips in the 12-month period or 10 trips over that four-year? Over the four-year yeah, period, yeah. Yeah, but still, you know, either way you break that down, that's a lot of trips to Rio. Um, Matt, you mentioned that your role shifted uh, from 2012 where you were the, the in, you know... The younger the, guy. The apprentice, yeah, if yeah, you like, yeah, and Malcolm was yeah. the reigning Olympic champion, correct? Yes, uh, from, that's right. From, yeah. from Beijing. From, from Beijing, yeah. And then you shifted, which I just think is quite a beautiful synergy, to the guide for you know, Will coming in as the apprentice, so to speak, with an Olympic campaign. Well, how did you? Well, I mean, what are the, some of the any examples of how you prepared Will mentally for what the Olympics was all about? Yeah, it's such a, a strange. It was such a strange experience for me, you know, coming into to you know with Malcolm partnering with Malcolm after the Beijing Games when he'd won. You know, we we were competitors for for eight years. We were one and two in the world with our respective partners, and um, we had a good relationship. But you know, we were competitors. We didn't have an amazing relationship, and you know, we were fighting every day to, to beat each other. And you know, he 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 won the trials for for Beijing, got selected. 
and uh, after those games we, we we talked about you know maybe doing another campaign and and I guess it was really the support of our coach Victor Kovalenko to say hey um, the the personality suit the, the the physique suit the dynamics work um, the decision making and and the, you know the, the complement for a partnership was was right so you know he he said hey uh, let's let's start the partnership together and and I guess from from there you know Malcolm was 10 years older than than I was um, even though I was uh, one and two we were one and two in the world um, I wasn't a world champion and you know over the next you know, 18 months as a partnership we we achieved that and to win the worlds in 2010 and that was a great um, experience for myself and our partnership to know that um, we we can do it, yep. you know, we can be successful. Malcolm had already won three world championships prior to to Beijing. Yep. And uh, and I I needed that confidence and and because I'm you know I'm, I'm the helm um, I guess a little bit more responsibility for myself, but but. The, you know, the success of the program is, is how well the two individuals, you know, myself or Malcolm or myself and Will, yeah. can can communicate together and to make those right decisions at the right time and handle that pressure. And we won the 2011 Worlds as well. We won the 2012 Worlds. And that really helped with the confidence to, to get into to London with the pressure and, you know, to get, get the job done. And, and that experience was instrumental in, in transitioning to a new partnership. Uh, with Will for Rio and so guiding Will into Rio as Malcolm perhaps guided you into London yeah. with some advice any practical tips you shared with Will about how to deal with the Olympics you know was it like Will this is no different from a World Cup race or anything you shared yeah I mean it's uh, it's interesting because we, we did our first event together and, and one of the journalists at our, our local event you know Sal Melbourne said oh, what is it like to or how do you feel to replace someone like Malcolm you know six times world champion Olympic champion and, and he said you know I'm, I'm taller I'm smarter I'm better looking I've got bigger shoes so um, <laughs> you know I should, I should be fine no worries and I think that you know that 17 years younger attitude of, of just having that hunger you know he, he, he works phenomenally hard he's, a, he's an amazing athlete and and he just put everything in and he didn't want to replace Mal he wanted to be Will Ryan and uh, he took that approach and, and really um, added that that level of additional level of motivation and and uh, that hunger attitude to, to let's 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 do it yeah and uh, and obviously in Rio I mean leading into it there was a bit of local media and it might have been national media as well about you know um, metal expectations for Australia and you know comments about the water quality and bags and things floating mm. around at times was was there a bit of concern around some of that stuff with Rio in, the, in terms of the sailing events or was it a bit, a bit, bit disproportionately reported in the media? Yeah, it, it was. It was pretty bad. You know, um, I didn't. You know, invest too much time in, in having a look at what was being reported. You know, only from our own experience being in Rio and, and you know getting sick uh, occasionally and uh, running into plastic bags, running into some dead animals and, and all sorts of stuff. Dead, and, dead animals. Yeah, there was there was a lot of things floating in in, well, uh, in the Rio Bay. You um, sure, there are animals. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure we didn't stop to have a look, actually. But, you know, it was, it was pretty bad. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, but for the games, it was fine. Yeah. You know, we, they, they had a lot of, lot of people there to, to clean all the rubbish in the water, and, and we didn't have any incidences, which is great. We didn't get sick, uh, which was really good for that one week. Um, so, you know, I guess it's a success. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's one of the things. But with 10 trips over an Olympic campaign, it's not like you didn't plan for things to go smoothly. So, I mean, that's obviously professionalism at its highest degree, right? Yeah, I mean... Uh, you know those those ten trips to to Rio were all in 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 addition to you know the the usual world World Cup circuit around the world and um, a lot of events to to South America as well. We had our World Championships coming in uh, in into the year. We we had Miami in America. We had to Europe. So all of this stuff is just you know combining that experience and the stuff that we did in Rio for for the water. We we were prepared for it. You know, we, we were looking out for it. Um, we, we had great support through Blackmores, um, so we knew that we would be able to stay healthy. Uh, our team had a really good, um, you know, management plan. We had a lot of precautions on the motorboats. Uh, so, you know, we, yeah, we, we were ready um, either way. And Matt, let's, uh, and, and so I'm going to give you a standard ovation, mate, for your success in Rio. Congratulations. Mate, um, in terms of, let's rewind the clock, the start in the sport. You're a local boy. Uh, we're recording this today at Pogo Physio, yeah. sitting here on the Gold Coast, and you just remarked that you, you ran into one of your, your schoolmates, a previous guest on the show, Shannon Eckstein. Yeah, yeah. You guys were house captains, is that right, at school? Yeah, yes, yes. you know, um, it's, it's amazing to, to see the success of, of athletes on the Gold Coast. 
uh, you know, from our, my experience with Shannon, we grew up together. We, um, you know, went to school together, and and just to see him, I haven't seen him for such a long time because I've been based in Europe, and he's been competing, and I've been competing, and um, you know, what a what a what a what a great day, you know, to, to catch <laughs> up as as mates and and to see how he's going. Yeah, well, we're just all getting older. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned thirty six, Matt, so that's a moment for me. But it's uh, it is a breeding ground, right, for for for, for sporting excellence. We do punch way above our weight in terms of international standards, don't we? But early days sailing, how were you introduced to it? Was it a dream that you had that you would find a career in sailing or how did it all start for you? Uh, yeah, not, not really actually. You know, we, my parents, um, we was, grew up in Banal Waters and went to school at TSS and um, every weekend we used to go out on the water and, and I think that comes down to the Gold Coast boating, you know, lifestyle. Um, you know, we're close to close to the beach close to the water and and every weekend head out in the water as a family and my parents one day decided to uh to bring a small wooden sabo uh which is a really small sailing boat and i think it was almost going to sink it was that old and uh yeah i used to get involved and and loved it uh and then sort of uh, my love for the sport grew from there wow and so you didn't grow up watching sailing aspiring to be at the you know olympic games it sort of just more organically grew you got that little craft and you... yeah i just i love what sailing represents you know i love being in control of a boat um, every day we're on the water it's different you yeah. know as as a, as a child you know you do so many different sports these days and um you know i was passionate in in all different sports you did ice hockey you go to grass hockey you did golf um got a black belt in taekwondo you did all sorts of stuff what year I did loved... you get your black belt uh, i think i was 11 11 oh, mate, that's I unbelievable yeah. I, I picked up a black belt at 11 in grafton so you were oh, up there here you go. what were you breaking boards and doing all yeah, yeah, doing all that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we might have to have a few little uh, practice sessions <laughs> after this. So you did taekwondo, all these sports, but yeah. sailing. There must have been something about that. You said it's the different, right? Way. I mean, it's different. You you get to to be in control of something. You wow. you control of the boat. You're on the water by yourself or with somebody else, and you've got that that connection. And you're just with the environment. You know, it's such an amazing sport that if it's light wind or strong wind, the boat goes fast. It's you're the one controlling it. And I think it's how you make the decisions. And, and as you know, really early on, I just I love to be outdoors and that's I guess made the difference for me to follow that passion in into sailing and I went through the the learn to sail programs at the South Boy Yacht Club up yeah. in Hollywell yeah. and uh and then you know the state level programs and then the national level programs and it probably wasn't until the Sydney Olympics that I I realized hey you know I'm 17 years old um I had success I'd won a junior world championships won an Australian championships and and sort of got guided into to some of the Olympic programs and they said, "Hey, you wanna you wanna embark on a, an Olympic campaign?" And uh, that was a really interesting experience. Wow! So prior to we'll go to uh, your Sydney Olympic experience with the flag, but prior to that, so you, you've gone through your school years. We, you were getting some success, I imagine. You know, at representative levels through your school years. Yeah, we we um, were state level champion um, in different classes uh, with my time at the Southport School as well, and and racing up in you know Royal Queensland at Southport Yacht Club, and we did a lot of you know, local events which we'd done well, and then we transitioned uh, to more national level events in the in the Sabo. Uh, I I didn't win the Sabo national championship so it was only you know top five yeah. which is a good result but really when i went to the double-handed classes the international 420 uh, that i saw with my brother was was really the first time that you know being national champion being world champion and for me i, I really related to to a double-handed you know class and that's sort of where i um i was able to get the best you know best performance and best results so at that stage could you have imagined Olympic medals? Did not, not at all, actually. No, 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 not at all. You know, we, we, our family business on the Gold Coast with my parents in, in management rights. Uh, I'd always thought of, of going into in property management. That was what I really wanted to do at that at that point. And sailing was just, you know, a great a great hobby, a great experience, and a great learning opportunity uh, for myself. But it was never going to be a career. That's wow. that's for sure. And had anyone at that part of the early days of your career, Matt? you know tapped you on the shoulder or spoken words of encouragement to say matt we really think you've got what it takes to to go on with this or that hadn't happened yet that that hadn't happened the first time that that happened was um actually over in germany in keel week uh in the the 2000 the two just before the the sydney 2000 games where I, uh, first time i met the australian olympic head coach yep. uh, victor kovalenko who uh, correct me if i'm wrong has been your career coach he has yeah. he's been my, my coach for for the last 16 years wow 
Yep. So you met Victor in uh, in Germany, and what was the conversation like? It was the first time that I'd met the the, the two Olympic gold medalists. Um, you know, three months before they'd won their gold medal, uh, Tom Tom King and Mark Turnbull and, and Jenny um, Armstrong and Belinda Stoll uh, in the 470 class. So the same class that I'm racing uh, at the moment, or have been racing really for the last 16 years, and just to to hear their journeys. And I grew up. You know, aspiring to, to them you know, within the sailing environment and, uh, and to, to meet them, to meet the coach and realise you know, what they were doing they were just coming into the, the Sydney Olympics for their preparation and, and to have that, that, um, yeah, that insight sort of said hey you know, I, can, I want to be an Olympian yeah. you know, I want to I get a gold medal and, and I want to represent my country and that's sort of what set me you know, along my way on, on your tra- my journey, trajectory yeah. so at Sydney uh, because you're a world junior champion I believe there was 8 athletes yeah. and you guys got to carry the Olympic, Olympic flag, closing yeah. flag. Um, home Olympics, I mean... Uh, uh, unbelievable, yeah. <laughs> what was going through your head? You Tell me. Well, I, I didn't, know, us, I I didn't know, um, didn't know what to think, you know. We, when John Coates calls you and said, oh, hey, you've, um, you've got two weeks of unlimited sport to come down and carry the Olympic flag, I was like, oh, my God, is this, <laughs> is this real? Uh, I was still just, you know, trying to finish school as well. Uh, in year 12 exams and all I could focus about was just wanting to go to Sydney and uh, you know we, we did did so many things you know we got to, to see so many different sports but actually I spent most of my time um, free tickets to watch the sailing you know sitting on Bradley's head and, and to watching Australia win gold uh, in the men and women uh, you know it's Basically every day, I used to travel from Penrith. Uh, it took me an hour on the on the on the train and and in the public transport to get there, and just sat there, sat there for three or four hours every day, and um, that was 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 amazing. Because I believe Malcolm won gold in Sydney, didn't he, in the four seventy class? M- Malcolm actually lost the trials for oh, um, for for yeah for for Sydney, um, but he was campaigning for oh, those so. those Olympics. But we did win gold in Sydney. We did, nation, yeah. Did so we, we we won gold in uh, in the men and women yeah. um, in our class. Yeah. We also won won gold in the Beijing Games, men and women, and then again in London. So and that's all through our coach, Victor Kovalenko. Uh, so five gold and a silver um, over uh, four games is, is a pretty pretty good achievement. And that's for me as a sports fan, it's just it's like an unbelievable legacy. I mean, I don't know that that's happened in any other event in Olympic history for Australia. I mean, eight, we've got eight chances. Uh, we've only got one chance, too. You know, we only allowed one representative. So to win, you know, five gold or silver out of eight, eight opportunities is, uh, is pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, remarkable. So Sydney 2000, you then get your first berth at an Olympics for London. Uh, that's a 12-year journey. And it reminds me somewhat of Eloise Wellens with her running, you know, who was a previous yeah. guest on the show. And, you know, multiple... Uh, Olympic campaigns crueled for Eloise through injury and then finally gets that opportunity. I have a feeling it was London that was Eloise's first game okay, as well. Yeah. Um, I just look at that and think that's absolutely phenomenal. That's 12 years of you know consistent effort, sowing seeds. Uh, how do you persevere to keep going to finally break through, missing Athens and Beijing. Yeah, I look at that and I think, geez, I'm a slow learner, you know. <laughs> why, why did it take 12 years? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a hard journey. It's a long journey. Uh, and and any, any Olympic representative is, is, you know, it's the same. When you, you're trying to, to be the best in your country and be the best in the world, it's going to take time. I didn't think that it would take 12 years, but I guess, you know, to have the support, to have the dedication just to keep going. You know, there was a lot of moments throughout those that period that I thought, hey, what, you know, what am I doing? My, my friends are finishing their degree, they're, they're in good jobs, um, they've got families yeah. starting and, and I just, some part of me said I can't, I can't, you know, give up, I just need to, I need to do it and, and it was really through 2010, you know, my, my father uh, and, and our family business, we wanted, he wanted to retire yep. and really gave you know, a bit of both my brother and I the ultimatum to say, hey, you know, what, are you either going to come into the family business or are you going to continue your know, Olympic sailing and, and they've been so supportive of me throughout my career and uh, we actually ended up selling the family family company you know, I, I said hey it's an, two years out from the London Olympics so it's been 10 years already I uh, just finished my, my degree and, and I said hey I, I need to do this you know, and they, they threw all their support behind me, and and but you know, ultimately we ended up selling the family company, so I could, you know, keep keep sailing and keep pursuing that that dream, and and you know, it was obviously worthwhile. 
So that being the case, Matt, what was the first thing that you said to your father and, and mother after? What, were the, what was the first conversation like that you had after London success? You know, they, they came over, which was fantastic. You know, they came over, my whole family came over to London, which is again... Because your so, wife, Rike, was, was, was competing, competing as, well. as well in yeah. the same class for, for Germany. For Germany, yeah, so, absolutely. So everyone was yeah. there. Mum and dad were there. You'd sold as a family and had the conversation with your brother as yeah. well about okay, we're going to sell this and we're here to support the, you know, support you and the dream. So what was that? I mean, I, I had, we had all my family there, yeah. you know, my mum, dad, my brother, um, his wife, um, her, her family as well came over. You know, my, my wife was competing every day. We were staying together outside the Olympic Village. Um, my, my wife's parents as well came over. And, you know, I, what, what an experience. Because I believe you were, you were sailing your father-in-law's craft. He's the That's manufacturer right. of the yeah. craft, right? Yeah. So this is a very special day. It and, is, And yeah. so what's that first conversation like? So many sacrifices. And for you, and I so I, I, I don't know if sometimes we grasp the sacrifices because, you know, you, you know it's in you, but it's still a decision to keep going and to sacrifice so many of the other things of, you know, life, the study, the family yeah. starting. And it's, you know, they're all stacking up. You're seeing your friends around you living that journey and you're doing this different path. So I just think it's fascinating. So you pushed on, you get to London, you win the gold. What did you say to mum and dad? What was the first conversation? Um, I, don't, I don't think we said anything. Yeah. You know, it was just, just a, a hug and, and you know, it's, it, it is hard, but it's such a personal journey. Mm. You know, um, we don't do it we don't do it for the recognition we don't do it for for the profile we do it because you know we we really set our mind to do it and we want to achieve something and do something extraordinary and you know when you, you're borrowing money off your parents and you you're more than 30 you know it gets gets kind of sad at some point but they they believe in what i want to achieve and my family and and her family and all all the people around us that are so connected to our campaign just have that 100 percent belief that um you know we, we want to do something yeah. amazing and that's what's really you know driven me to, to keep going and to keep getting the results and, and to keep exploring the opportunities so it's about as you said a personal journey maximizing yeah. your own potential so at no point even though there's pressures and everything else did you really think about quitting no n- not, not at all um there was a point um i guess after we lost the trials for beijing uh that i that I'd stopped for for eight eight you know, to 10 months, uh, was really disappointed. You know, we, we were world number one, number two, and, and lost the trials. And after eight years, that was, that was really, you yeah, know, that was to sort of took its toll. You know, I hadn't, hadn't finished my degree then, um, spent a lot of time away and, and, you know, my wife lost her Olympic trials for Germany as well. For uh, Beijing. For, for Beijing. Yep. And both of us just, you know, after eight years, we hadn't really had much to show for it. You know, we hadn't been an Olympian. We, we hadn't got um, you know, achieved our dreams. We delayed everything, and you know, we both took a bit of time off, and 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 I, I guess you know, making that decision again to to keep going uh, for both of us was was nice to be able to do that together, and we're so happy that we did. And you obviously met Rike edited sailing something or other right yeah you know um actually my coach you know victor kovalenko he he uh with the fam with her family connection with zigamaya boats uh you know he's uh, an amazing boat builder and, and a very, very successful one uh for the sydney olympics for the for the gold and the men and women he he built their boats oh, wow. uh for our boat in london um and as an example the boats in rio he had one to five uh in in the game so wow. he's, he's obviously doing doing a good job yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my my coach in 2001 um, knew the family well and invited Rika to come to Australia to sail for for Australia originally uh, into our team and uh, <laughs> she was only here for a couple of weeks <laughs> and uh, yeah I, uh, I managed to to uh, persuade her to, uh, woo her with your charm yeah yeah that's right who asked who out Matt <laughs> yeah uh, I think she said I was too short. So <laughs> probably uh, I did, yeah, I did definitely. Right, that's so it's a, been been what fifteen years now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, an amazing. We have an amazing partnership and been able to to do an Olympic campaign together. Uh, still be married, which is great, <laughs> and have two two amazing children. Yeah, and she's still supporting me now, um, which is fantastic. Yeah, beautiful, Matt. Um, let's do a performance round. So this is where I ask you a few performance yeah. oriented questions. You ready to roll? Ready to Here go. Here we go, Matt Belcher. What's your most dislike training session would be uh strong wind a uh, bit of strength in the morning um so doing a, a strength work in the morning then then strong wind you know 30 30 knots uh really cold conditions 
uh, and then having to, to come in and debrief it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say cold, what's the coldest ambient temperature you've probably So started? probably about five degrees. Yeah. Uh, five degrees, we're in a six mil wetsuit, we're on the water for three, three and a half hours, um, really, really, you know, strong wind. We're getting wet constantly. Uh, yeah, that's that's not enjoyable. And you just, do you just know before you go out it's going to be miserable? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we delay. We're trying to be the last one on the water. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got beanies on. You just It's just hard. You know, you're warmed up, then you're cold. You get warmed up again, you get cold. Uh, yeah, it's just terrible. So it's not all sailing in, uh, in the warmth of Rio? No, no, not at all. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, the session you most love, love training session? Yeah. Uh, Offshore Gold Coast out here, uh, 10, 12 knots, um, really good breeze, planing conditions, a bit of dolphins in the, in the background. Uh, yeah, big waves, that's probably our favourite. Big waves is in out off the seaway? Out off the seaway, yeah, absolutely love it. You know, our, our craft is only 4.7 metres, but when we go out in three metre seas, uh, good planing conditions, so the boat's fully powered up, uh, and to be able to play in those waves, uh, particularly offshore here, it's fantastic. Yeah, there's nothing better. So leading into Rio, did you take Will for a few of these uh, off the off the seaway? Yeah, we did, Ab- absolutely. You know, we, we did quite a lot of training up here, um, up at South Bay Yacht Club, and went offshore all the time which was yeah, amazing. The conditions out here are, is, is phenomenal. Yeah, it's really good fun. The boat's going extremely fast, uh, manageable in, in, in a good sea state. It's, yeah, it's cool. Mate, amazing. Uh, I'll have to keep a closer eye out there next time. There's a bit of swell and I'll see if I can see you yeah. out the back. Matt, uh, pre-race meal. What do you eat? What did you eat before uh, Rio and London? Uh, you know, um, fruit, cereal, um, you know, a bit of toast, uh, a couple of eggs. Uh, it actually varies, you know, it varies a fair bit. The only thing we have consistently is on Sunday we have pancakes. <laughs> Who makes them? Uh, we try and alternate, but I, I'm, a, I'm a bit better at making them. So I imagine with two Olympians in one household, there's a bit of competition on the best batch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mate, uh, bedtime, morning time, what's your routine like around that when you're in full focus training? Uh, it varies quite a bit, you know. Um, it varies when I've got the family or, or not. Uh, you know, with, with the kids, sometimes they're on the circuit with me and doing the events. But, but usually, you know, we do the debrief, we, we try and get a, do a, a recovery session. So we do physios, we, we try and eat something, drink something, and um, maybe do a bit of a stretch, warm down, and, uh, and get to bed. Maybe watch a bit of a movie and get to bed as soon as we can. Yeah, cool. Start all over again. <laughs> yeah, and away it goes again. Who's the athlete, Matt, that you most admire and why? Uh, good, good question. Um, it would have to be a British athlete, you know, Ben, ben Ainsley. Uh, he's the most successful Olympian, uh, Olympic sailor of all time. You know, four Olympic golds, you know, Olympic silver. Uh, I got to know him uh, quite quite a bit. You know, through through Olympic campaigning, and he's now just uh, embarked on an America's Cup journey. Um, so he would, yeah, he would have to be one of the, yeah, one of my most admired um, within the sporting world, or the sailing world for sure. Well, wow. who's the toughest competitor you've ever raced, Matt? Uh, the Croatian team, uh, Shimi Fontella, who won, won the gold uh, in, in Rio. We've been um, yeah, battling each other for the last eight, nine years. Um, he's two times world champion. He won the Worlds this year and uh, throughout this year and, and actually throughout most of my career, we've been sort of one and two and, and fighting. But, uh, you know, we, we get on pretty well. Uh, I've asked him to, to coach my son when he gets a bit older. Um, so we have, a, we have a great relationship, but when we're on the water, they're certainly, certainly not friends. There's no, yeah, there's no friends. <laughs> friends on the dice. Yeah, that's right. And Matt, uh, is there a racing mantra that you use? I mean, uh, often athletes have these consistent things that they like to, you know, Yeah, um, it, it would it'd be, you know, trust, trust myself and, and follow my dreams, which is really, you know, I guess the message my, my coach gave me, you know, 15, 16 years ago and, and helped me get through um, some difficult points and, and to keep me motivated and to keep me going. And, and that's just, yeah, just having the trust that I'm doing the right thing and making the right decisions and, you know, just go with it, see where it goes. Because it is a trust exercise in trusting the coach, trusting the program. Yeah, particularly in sailing, you know, we, there's a lot of variables we, we can't control. You know, we can't control the, the water, we can't control the, the wind and and the waves and um, the other boats, the influence the other boats have have on you as well. So we're just a lot of things you just got to go with it and hope it goes well. But there's certainly things you can do to prepare better. And, and that's where, you know, the success comes from our sport is just preparing for all those different elements and, and understanding them and, and trying to, to you know, be ready. So if they do happen, then you can capitalise and, and get the best out of it. Which is where I, I just part of the admiration I have for your success is that you, there are so many variables. We mentioned Shannon Eckstein before who you ran into today here. And uh, it's one of the things I admire about Shannon in a sport where there are so many uncontrolled controllable factors to have sustained success over time it's like wow there's really some 
gift and abilities that lay there to be able to do that you know it's not yeah absolutely you know it's not jumping into a static 50 meter pool it's it's a completely wild environment so i just think that's incredible that's that's what makes it interesting right Mm. you know um the fact that we have those variables uh and we have that that depth and and that understanding of of knowing okay this could this could happen or or understanding the currents in rio and in the geographical effects and really getting to that detail um whether it will help you or not but it it helps your 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 knowledge and you know to, to be able to to see those things as they're they're happening and to be able to capitalize and and make the right decisions at the right time and we're all going to make mistakes yeah so it's just making uh, a few less than than your competitors yeah that simple make a few less mistakes yeah it sounds simple gold medal silver medal (laughs) easy no matter the physicality of sailing uh, I've, ha- I've had some fun working with some V8 race car, you know, drivers over the years. And it's one thing that, you know, they don't just sit behind a wheel. Yeah. <laughs> These are highly tuned, you know, athletes. Uh, it's the same with sailing, right? Can you oh, give listeners a perspective yeah. into the, the physicality, the physical training that you undergo? Obviously, it's physical out in the water. And, yeah. you know, like you've described your favourite and, you know, least yeah. favourite sessions. Yeah. So what do you, what's your routine look like? Yeah, I mean, um, it's really interesting when you, you see the team you all lined up together. We all look completely different. We're different sizes, different shapes, different strengths. Um, you know, and we all have different requirements, which is which is a really cool thing about our sport. So we get that that diversity. You know, for myself, um, my role is completely different to Will's role. Uh, his uh, his upper body strength has to be you know quite high. Yep. Um, his cardio levels are extremely high. His workload is, is really high. His, his heart rate is is you know in some light wind races down to sixty, you know fifty five, and and he goes up to one hundred and ninety. You know, completely maxing out. Um, from from a pumping, wow. uh, from the physique of trying to force the boat to be as fast as it can, and um, yeah, myself, it's a lot about decision making. It's a lot about um, you know controlling the boat, producing the speed, and, and trying to put us in the right direction. So the level of, of concentration over a long period. Sometimes we're on the water for, for six to, to eight hours. You know, when we've got to try and switch on and switch off, and a lot of my fitness is is cardio based. It's based on injury prevention because we are in a small small boat, so we're we're putting our bodies in in awkward positions for for quite a uh, you know prolonged periods. Uh, it's about um, you know being able to have a good core strength, hiking, um, and producing enough leverage to produce the speed. And uh, and a bit of you know obviously upper body to be able to to control the sheets and and uh, and general you know general fitness to move and be dynamic in the boat and and being agile and flexible and, and things like that. So for your physical strength, uh, you know the, the stability. Uh, yeah, what, yeah. what are the practical things that you like to do to? get yourself physically strong yeah I, I like to run you know for me um you know I, I love to try and do as many cases as i can a week and wow. um it does vary when we're in competition and out of competition obviously um but i'll try and do you know 25 30 35 you know k's k's a week wow. uh it's a good um psychological release for me it's really good for my my base level cardio uh I do a little bit of cycling not as much as my my sailing partner uh I do a lot of uh trx work yep. uh, so just using my body weight to to um to do strengths and, and sit-ups and push-ups and, and things like that, TheraBand. Yeah. So a lot of my, my exercises are not, you know, weight, weight, you know, using weights. You know, they're using my body weight, yeah. uh, um, stretching, uh, things like that. And, and that really helps for me to maintain a good level of fitness, um, but also, you know, um, not adding too much weight, which is also, you know, really important for our sport. Yeah, just keeping that weight down. And injuries, Matt, any injuries that you've had to really work through? Over uh, touch, the... touch wood. Um, no, you're good. No, I'm, I'm being, I've been good. <laughs> You know, that's, um, you know, to be 16 years, you know, Olympic campaigning and not having injuries, certainly I've been very blessed. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, am I get, I'm getting older and if I decide to do another campaign, that's certainly something that I need to address and, and work really hard on to, to make sure I can really maximise every every day that we're, we're scheduled for training and and, uh, and to keep getting the best out of myself. And, and, you know, you just lose so much time if you get injured and it really sets you, um, you know, sets you back on your campaign. Uh, a consistency, that unbroken training training you know is just irreplaceable I, I find in high, you know high performance so yeah absolutely because you build on rhythm you know you get a good result and you need a break and you need to build off the success of the last event and you start to create this really you know successful um, environment and you just you just build from it it's like if you you start an event well in the beginning of the season generally your season will actually be quite good mm. it's really hard psychologically if you have a really bad mm. first event 
to try and pull that pull that back and uh, you know what we try and do is to just try and focus on the right events do it at the right time and and to keep building that that momentum to to ultimately you know peak when you need to you build on rhythm i think that's brilliant yeah. matt um talking about rhythm i must ask the zone you know we hear about the zone and different athletes described in different ways how would you describe for listeners when you're in the zone on the water? What does it feel like? What are the sounds like? What's the zone like? It's a really good question and something very hard to, to achieve in sailing because we have so many distractions. You know, we, we have to be down at the boat park pretty early in the morning. We have a lot of media requirements. But for us, it takes us an hour just to rig the boat. So we are in the same boat park as all our competitors. So, you know, we, we've competed most of our careers against each other and you, you know them and you that decision of whether to talk to them or not um, when you're talking to each other. So I guess, you know, for me when I'm in the zone, it's just being silent, you know, where, where we don't have to talk much with my sailing partner. We're on the water, we feel relaxed, we're, we're giggling or we're talking about something, you know, about girls or something else, you know, we're, we're right in the middle of, of just about to compete. And uh, when we're not having to talk much, uh, that's when I, I guess I have the feeling that, hey, we're, we're on the same, we've got a really good synergy, synergy here and, um, you know, we're, we're ready to go. So it's, it's I guess, minimising that communication. When we're having to talk a lot, then I then I go, okay, we're not we're not quite there yet. Yeah, and so it feels like two body, you know, two people moving completely in sync in the craft as well. And Yeah, it's, it's really, really difficult. And, and to be honest, you know, we're still, we're still working on it. You know, for as a sport, we there's a lot of information we need to process. We we have weather briefings in the morning. We we go over the currents together for the day. We um, obviously forecast. We try and decide what kind of tuning we want for the boat. Um, so we're doing a lot of analysis pre and post, um, even getting to the boat park. We're preparing all our, our food, our drinks. Um, a lot of that self managed. We have a, we have a big a big team to support us, but most of the ath- the sailing athletes like to do it. Um, you know, do it do it themselves, and uh, you know washing the boats preparing all the gear checking on the gear uh you know we're we sort of are managing all that process and you know getting onto the water getting our wet weather gear the type of clothing we're going to use so we have a really good understanding of of you know do we need a, a different thickness wetsuit or do we need a splash top for the day how long are we going to be on the water how many races have we got um you know and all these things that we're having to to factor into and, and also making sure our, our partner is is there with us as well mm. you know we're on the same wavelength and just got a good mood yeah. for, for the day sailing and, and then we come ashore you know we we have to analyze the performance we have to analyze to see if we had any rule infringements as well maybe we might be in a protest or or something else we need to have a discussion with our rules advisor or um, you know and all these things it starts from you know 7 30 in the morning and we finish it at 8 30 at night and we might have only you know been on the water for three hours four hours wow. and it's really hard to break all that down and just say hey we're on the water together our job is to get to that mark before anybody else that's all we got to do <laughs> you know um it's really hard to to you know change and uh and to get you into the right mindset so i can't complain about being off running at the moment and having to go through the rigors of putting all my bike gear on <laughs> <laughs> it's a good problem to have yeah, yeah. matt um bucket list What's on the bucket list, both personally and, and in sport? Yeah, I'd like um, I'd like to you know, successfully transition out of, of Olympic sailing. Um, you know, and whether that's now or in Tokyo, that's something that for me to have that balance. You know, I want to go into business. Uh, I'd love to to win another Olympic medal. Uh, I'd love to do other forms of sailing as well. So whether that's America's Cup, whether that's offshore sailing, um, and I'd like to to be involved, you know, in the future of of, of our Olympic team. Yeah, so, so it's a lot there. Yeah, it's a, uh, but I like the ambition. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I've always I've always taken that approach, and you know, at the moment since since Rio, um, trying to get involved in different you know um, property development projects and yeah. build my experience. Um, I'm doing a double masters now uh, at, Bond at Bond University. Yep. Um, you know, I'm involved with the Australian Sailing Team. We're trying to relocate uh, our, our subsite of our team up to the Gold Coast. So we're, we're dealing with council at the moment and trying to build a structure and and uh, to build all the systems and, and put that up at Southport Yacht Club. Yeah. Uh, I'm mentoring uh, some of the kids, the high performance program up at the club as well. So for me to come back to the club, you know, you know 25 years of being a member and, and all their support for my Rio campaign, you know, on a, on a weekly, you know, almost daily basis up there is really rewarding for me. 
and and just you know to settle settle the family down you know just to to go down to Corumban Wildlife on a Sunday and go to soccer class with my son uh, and um, you know just it's exciting you know just to, to be based back on the Gold Coast and to have that you know have that balance solid roots and so Tokyo 2020 you're going to be part of it in some way shape or form but it sounds like you're just finding the way at the moment yeah I'm you know for us Rio was was a difficult journey you know it was a long time away and and we wanted to we wanted to defend that goal from London and and we we believe that we we can you know um we have an amazing partnership and we've had some amazing success and we know we can be better individually and as a team and we're just i guess looking for support at the moment to to say hey you know i'm getting old but we feel like we can be better and we we want to have you know i guess another crack and and at the moment we're going to our our, you know our long-term supporters who have really helped us you know over the last you know for me individually for the last 10 16 years and and our team for the last four years and say hey just give us another opportunity give us another chance and and that's sort of where we're at at the moment trying to generate the support and and trying to generate the funds to to help support also my family and the time away and and that commitment and um you know everything we do every dollar we we spend is back into our program it costs a lot yeah um, because sailing's you know not not a cheap sport it's there's a lot of investment yeah there's there is a lot of investment you know a lot of time a lot of a lot of equipment um a lot of travel and and you know it's 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 tough but you know for us it's um to really rewarding and, and that you know that's where we're at and hopefully in a, yeah. in another month and another six weeks we'll be able to get that that support and, and say hey we're going to give it another crack cool well mate a couple of last questions final ones one bit of advice from matt belcher dual olympic medalist gold and silver uh, multiple world titles uh, sailor of the year I didn't even touch on that today but that was uh, how many times was that Matt? Um, that was in 2013 was you know, to, yeah. Yeah, to be you know, the Royal Interna- International uh, International Sailor of the Year that was pretty cool very unexpected yeah. Um, but yeah hugely proud yeah, that yeah. Was, uh, was a great great moment in my career and that was the first year of our new partnership with, um, with Will, with, with Will yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty pretty cool um, so all of those accomplishments what's the one bit of advice Matt you'd give to people listening in terms of how they can pursue their physical best performance. If yeah, you boil I mean, it down to one thing. It sounds it sounds pretty corny, but I think, you know, coming back to the advice and of, you know, trust yourself and, and follow your dreams and I never really wanted to be a professional sailor. I still don't see myself as as one, which is kind of strange to strange to say and sit here and, and tell you that. Everyone else does. Everyone else does. <laughs> but I've I've just I've followed the things that I've I've you know wanted to do and, and love doing and, and passionate about and I've just said, hey, okay, it might be unorthodox, it might be different might not be the best career choice but you know why why not why you know why can't you do things that you love in your life and and just go with it and see where it leads you and you know I never thought I would be you know sitting here today and with some of the success we've had and and some of the opportunities you know outside of sailing that I've had and mm. the people that I've met that I've met the the partnerships that I've had um yeah what a what a life it's pretty it's pretty cool I gotta ask you said you, you still don't see yourself as a professional sailor what do you mean well it's like a full-time hobby right <laughs> <laughs> is it because you're so busy with all the other things? It's kind of like, oh yeah, that. Yeah, you know, I've, I've never treated it as a job. Oh wow! Um, you were extremely professional. Um, we uh, we we have a, a, a great support. We've got a great program. It's very professional in the way it's it's run and managed, and and um, you know the way we approach our campaign. But I, I just I still don't see it as as a job. You know, I'm on the water every day. Um, I get to do something that I love, and I don't see it as as something that's oh, wow. yeah, it's it, it's a career sort of thing. And maybe therein lies some of the success, Matt. Matt, uh, if you could have dinner with three people, living or past, it's a bit of a fun question, Matt. I, I, I see we've uh, started hard, we've uh, worked through, we're finishing hard. Yeah. Who would they be? Oh wow, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it'd be kind of interesting to have dinner with uh, yeah, well, Paul Elstrom. We'll go sailing because we are in the sailing sailing sphere. Um, yeah, unfortunately, he just he just passed away. But for be a four times Olympic champion to see the history of sailing, you know, back uh, back in nineteen in Melbourne, nineteen fifty four, and and um, you know the Tokyo and Rome and all those that period of sailing, he you know, he was quite instrumental in some of the basic things that we have on our boat. Uh, that would be kind of interesting. Um, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Um, who else? Who else? Two more. Get two more seats to fill, Matt. I think it'd be interesting to have dinner with you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can arrange that. Yeah, mate. We'll we'll have to catch up. We've uh, this has been twelve months in the making, so hopefully yeah. dinner won't take that long. But mate, definitely all the um, people that you've met, all the stories, <laughs> um, all the history of the podcast would be kind of kind of cool. Right, well, that would be interesting. I will gladly take all a right. seat at that table, Matt. Count me in. So we've got one left. 
Um, oh, who else? <laughs> who else? Someone political I would, would be kind of interesting. Um, a bit of a laugh, probably Donald Trump. All right, let's get him. Let's get him there, mate. I was hoping you would say Donald because yeah. I, I would think he would be a fascinating guy. Yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to have, 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 have a conversation <laughs> with. All right, mate. So we're going to make this happen. Well, that's cool, Matt. And last question: we like, we like to issue listeners with a physical challenge for the week. It can right. be anything. It can be extremely difficult. It can be, you know, very entry level. It can be anything. Yeah. yeah. What would Matt Belcher's physical challenge for the week be? <laughs> Oh, um, for me, it would be a, a long a long run. Okay. How long yeah, are we talking? So, more than 20Ks. Okay. Yeah. So, listeners, you've got a week to get yeah. out there and run more than 20Ks. <laughs> Pop us a, shoot a message over on social media to Matt and I so we know yeah. it's been actioned. Good. And, Matt, on that, where can listeners find out more about your journey uh, and potentially support is there anything that listeners can help support or get around that, that's important to you yeah you know for sailors we're, we're, we are trying to you know increase the recognition for the sport and, and just you know get get more kids into yacht clubs so um, you can follow us head down to Southport Yacht Club uh, Holly Oil and Main Beach and, and get your kids into sailing um, you can be able to follow our, our journey and our campaign uh, through that um, but also on Facebook you know we've got our, our Facebook site um, we try and uh, keep everyone up Date as much as we can uh, and yeah just um, yeah thanks for the support so listeners we'll drop all links to Matt's uh, pages the Facebook page and, and social media etc in the show notes so jump over Pogo Physio have a look for the show notes and Matt Belcher I just want to say mate thank you very much I know you're a, a family man you've got two young children and it's a busy world for you lots of responsibilities um, thank you for, for popping along and sharing so openly about your success yeah no worries thanks, thanks Matt me. legend Cheers. Listeners, I trust you enjoyed this episode of the Physical Performance Show, uh, deep diving into what it takes for Olympic gold medal success. So big thanks to Matthew Belcher. Don't forget to uh, take on the physical challenge, follow Matt on social, and shout out. Let us both know if you enjoy the program. Pop us in, uh, in your messages. Use our uh, handles, and uh, we'd love to know that you've uh, taken something away from the interview. Coming up in next week's episode of the Physic Performance Show, I catch up with an Australian fish. Yeah, a fish. Chloe McArdle. Chloe McArdle has an incredible swimming biography. Chloe has, I dare say, swum more kilometres than potentially any human alive. Chloe's bio includes 21 solo crossings of the English Channel, including eight crossings in one season and three in one week. Chloe's also done the double crossing in 2010, 2012, and 2015, and is the fourth person to do a triple non-stop crossing. And guys, a crossing's 34 kilometers, so get your head around that one. Uh, Chloe's also won the Manhattan Island Marathon swim and holds the world record as of the summer of 2015 for the longest ever unassisted open water swim at 124 kilometers. Just remarkable. So this is a deep dive, pardon the pun, into the world of marathon elite swimming. Guys, uh, massive thank you to Daryl Misson, the audio engineer who makes this show sound good. Daz, you're an absolute champion. Thanks for all you do for the Physical Performance Show, and I know I and the listeners really appreciate all your good work. So thank you, Daryl. Guys, have a great week. Until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. This has been the Physical Performance Show, and I'm Brad Beer.